Hello. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to this uh, 11th lecture of our public uh, astronomy series. Uh, my name is Shudam Mao from Center of Astrophysics here. Today I'm delighted to have uh, Professor Brian Schmidt, the president of the Australian National University, to deliver a lecture. Brian obtained his PhD in 1993 from Harvard University, where I first met him. Uh, he then moved to Australia in 1995, forming his own supernova search teams, which led to the surprising discovery in astronomy about the accelerating universe. For this, he has won numerous uh, prizes. Uh, I think I only need to name one. That is the 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics. I should also mention that uh, Brian has uh, made uh, important contributions to the collaboration between China and Australia. For that, I'm grateful to him for his involvement uh, in the bilateral collaborations between the two countries. Uh, without further ado, I uh, introduce you to Professor Schmidt to deliver his lecture. Let's welcome. Please. Thank you, Shude. And thank you, everyone, from coming out, especially those students doing their exams this week. I greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> so today, I'd like to tell you about three big questions for astronomy. But these are not the only three big questions. They're just three questions that I think are particularly interesting. So there is much more going on astronomy than what I will tell you today. But let's think why we do astronomy. We do astronomy because it's interesting. And we've been doing it for a very, very long time. This is a star cluster known as the Pleiades at least the Pleiades in English. They've been around for 80 million years, and every human that has ever lived on planet Earth has seen these stars because they're visible from the northern and the southern hemisphere. I grew up in Alaska, very far north. I could see them there. When I go down to the southern part of Chile, I can see them there. And every culture, including Chinese culture, has referred to them. But I'll take you to one of the oldest pictures that we have, which is this one, in a cave from France 17,300 years ago. And what you see here are the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, as they're called in many cultures, not Chinese. And they're sitting next to this animal, this bull. Why? Well, in European culture, that bull is known as Taurus. 17,300 years ago, we called the constellation in Europe the same thing we call it today. The seven sisters, or the Pleiades, are referred to the seven sisters all over the world. Not everywhere, but in the stories of Aboriginal Australians, they're referred to as the seven sisters. The Aboriginal Australians came to Australia 40,000 years ago. And that is the same story of those same stars that occur in Thailand, occur in India, and occur in Europe. These are the oldest stories that we know of of humanity. So, astronomy has been something humans have been thinking from as long as we can imagine. Today, I was with my prime minister at your ancient observatory in the middle of Beijing. And there we were talking about science and collaboration. The first connection between Australia and China in the modern era came from astronomers. An astronomer named Chris Christensen came here and worked on radio astronomy. And that paved the way for opening up of diplomatic relations nine years later. Today, I am here visiting, partially to be with my prime minister, 
but partially to work with my colleagues here in China on the new questions of astronomy, three of which are here. So these questions are, what are planets like beyond our own solar system? There may even be a planet in our own solar system we do not know about. What is the life history of the universe? And what is this stuff we keep talking about called dark matter and dark energy? Those are three questions I'm going to talk about today and how we're working, and working often together, to solve. So, let's talk about planets. We have eight planets going around the sun. There may be a ninth one that we will discover, or there may not be. Pluto remains a planet in my heart, but not in the official heart of the International Astronomical Union. And so, there are amazing uh, leaps forward being made in understanding planets. In 1995, there were no planets known. This is the catalog of planets today. There are right now 2,107 planets confirmed beyond our own solar system. When I moved to Australia in 1995, zero. All of those have been discovered in the last 20 years. So how do we find planets? Well, there's a number of techniques we can use. One is by their motion. So when a planet orbits its sun, the sun also orbits the center of mass between the planet and the star. And so that means if you're looking at the star and we look at its spectrum, that's the light that it puts out, the fingerprints of every element leave little traces. And those traces move back and forth due to what we call the Doppler shift. That Doppler shift is something that affects all waves and it's what gives the change of sound of a ambulance or a police car as it travels past you. It also causes the color of light to shift. Now that color of light shift is very tiny in the case of planets moving around their sun. So in the case of Earth moving around our sun, it's about one meter per second. One meter per second is this fast. But with modern equipment, like this installed in Europe in a very high precision spectrograph, we can measure speeds now about like what I'm walking. And that's to stars whose light takes a thousand years to reach us traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second. So those stars are 300,000 kilometers times 31 million seconds per year. That's a number most of you probably don't know. Times a thousand years away. And yet I can measure that they're moving this fast due to technology. That is amazing. And that is what has allowed us to start discovering large numbers of planets. But it's not the only way we discover planets. With modern technology, we can correct the blurriness of the atmosphere with lasers. And that means we can make really good quality images from the ground now with telescopes much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we get clearer images. And that means we can start seeing planets for the first time directly. So here's how adaptive optics works. You essentially make a contact lens or a, a pair of glasses. You look at what the atmosphere does and you bend a mirror to do exactly the opposite. And when you do that, you can see your image goes, in this case, the planet Uranus, goes from being fuzzy to looking much, much better than you can see it with the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's from the ground. 
with this technique now, we are able to, for the first time, see planets. Here is a star with three planets around it, and you can see them start orbiting. But this is just the beginning, because we're building a new generation of telescopes, much bigger than previous ones, and with looking at different parts of light. So this, the what we call uh, the uh, Atacama Millimeter Array, or ALMA, uh, this telescope is able, with radio waves, to look at stars. In this case, a star that's just recently formed. And you can see around the star there are little holes. It's looking at gas. And those holes, we believe, are caused by the planets going around and essentially vacuuming up that gas and forming and getting bigger. This is one of the most amazing images to me because you are seeing a planet system being formed. That is this amazing telescope in Chile located up at 5,000 meters. Uh, in the driest place on the planet. But this next generation of telescopes to come are potentially even more exciting. This is one of those new telescopes. I'll show you all three of them. This is known as the Giant Magellan Telescope. We hope it will be built in the beginning of the next decade, so about 19, or sorry, 2020. And it will use these laser systems, but this telescope is 25 meters across. And being so big, it will allow us to see um, these planets better than ever before. But that's not the only way we can discover uh, these planets. Another way is something that some of you will have seen yourself a few years ago. I don't know what the weather was like in Beijing on this day, but in 2012, Venus went across the face of the sun. It transited that. It doesn't do it very often. Every hundred years or so, it does it twice. But when it does that, the sun becomes one ten thousandth fainter than it normally is due to the shadow of Venus. If we go out and we look at thousands upon thousands of stars, we can see this happen occasionally. And we have started doing that. And we can use little telescopes on Earth to do this. For example, I am part of a program that uses a set of telescopes in Australia, a set of telescopes in Chile, and a set of telescopes in Namibia so we can always see the sky. And we keep looking and looking and looking, and we look for those little uh, things getting fainter. And so here was our first discovery. We found about 35 planets now this way. You go through and you see suddenly the star gets a little fainter. That's when its planet goes in front of it. An eclipse, so to speak. <coughs> now, we can do this in the ground, but you can do it much, much better if you get above the atmosphere. And the Kepler Space Telescope has been doing this. And it has literally discovered thousands upon thousands of objects. Here's its latest set of planets. Not all of these are confirmed, but there are 4,696 planets it's discovered, of about 2,000 of which are confirmed. And you can look, and it's how long it takes for the planet to go around its stars. 10 days, 100 days, 365 days is Earth. And the radius, how big the planet is relative to Earth. So I have conveniently put Earth on there, Jupiter, uh, Neptune. And you can see we have already discovered something that has 365 days and the size of the Earth right there. Now, is that exactly the Earth? No, because it was not going around the sun. But it is almost impossibly difficult to find Earth with this technique. It's very easy to find very big stars 
that are close to their suns and very difficult to find Earths because Earths are small and they're a long way from their star. Yet we've already found one. From this experiment, we can already say that the average solar type star has an Earth type planet going around it. The Earth is not unusual. It is typical. The average star in the sky probably has something more or less like the Earth going around it. So that means that if we want to go out and find a new home after we've destroyed our own planet or it destroys itself, we have a lot of opportunities, but we'll need to do our homework. And doing our homework is what astronomers are doing for you. How? We're putting new, bigger telescopes in orbit so that we can find around nearby stars, Earth-like planets. And when we do, we can do something remarkable. We can use these new generation of huge telescopes to look into their atmospheres. How? Well, let's look at Venus when it went in front of the sun. You can see this is a real picture. This rim, that's not Photoshop. That is light from the sun going through Venus's atmosphere and being bent, refracted through the atmosphere and traveling to us here on Earth. When that light travels through Venus's atmosphere, it picks up the fingerprints of Venus's atmosphere. So we can, if we have enough light, figure out what is in Venus's atmosphere by looking at how when Venus is in front of the sun, how its fingerprint of his atmosphere suddenly appears. And to give you a sense how this might work, this is going to be the largest of the next generation of telescopes built by the Europeans, 39 meters across, assuming they save enough money. The less money they save, the smaller the telescope is, but it's still a very large telescope, 39 meters across. That's the scale of this entire auditorium. Everything manufactured to be in one place to 10 nanometers. Amazing technology. But it can potentially pick up the fingerprint of Earth-like planets around certain type stars. And to show you how it works, here is our sun. Each one of those little uh, dark spots in the color of the rainbows is the fingerprint of an atom. That's hydrogen, that's sodium, and that's the stuff that's in the sun itself. But if you look very carefully up to the corner of up here, those little bands are not in the sun. That's the Earth's oxygen. And so if the Earth went in front of the sun, that fingerprint of light would be imprinted on the sun to an alien civilization looking at us. We can do the same thing with these new giant telescopes because they can collect so much light, they can see the tiny effects, in principle, caused by oxygen in the atmosphere. So I think that's pretty exciting, but it's not the only thing we're doing. We're also going to be able to tell the life history of the universe. So to do that, we need to understand a little bit of how our universe works. So to do that, we're going to go back to 1929 when Hubble went out and he made this diagram. He looked at how bright stars were in nearby galaxies. So if the brightest stars were bright, they're here. If they were faint, they're over here. And he knew that the further an object was, the fainter it appeared. So he said, these are the distant objects and these are the nearby objects. He also noticed that you could measure how much their light had been stretched by the Doppler shift. He thought it was the Doppler shift. 
It's not the Doppler shift, it turns out. But it's effectively the same thing. And so objects that from the Doppler shift don't show any motion down here show a lot of motion at the top. And you can see the further away, the faster the motion. And the motion's always away from us. Things are red shifted. Their light is stretched red. So from this, he announced to the world in 1929, this means the universe is expanding. Now, why did he say that? Let me show you a cartoon. Here's the universe, or at least a cartoon version of it, which I'm going to expand. So I've expanded the universe. And now let's see what happens when I compare before and after. So when I compare before and after, I can see effectively what happens. So nearby objects, when I have overlaid the two, well, they've only moved a little bit, hardly at all. So if I was measuring how fast they were moving away from us, it would be a little bit. And if I look a long ways away, well, those things have moved a lot. You can see when I expand the universe, nearby things move a little bit, distant things move a lot. Just what Hubble saw. And it doesn't matter where you are, everyone in the universe sees exactly the same thing. Now imagine the universe is expanding. Let's run it into reverse. What happens? Things get closer and closer and closer, and there is a time when everything in the universe is on top of everything else, the Big Bang. If the universe is expanding, it's sort of a natural expectation of what the universe will be like in the past. So that means that when I take the Hubble Space Telescope and I take a very, very um, long exposure, a long picture of the sky. So in this case, a piece of sky, much smaller than the moon. We zoom in and what do we see? We see 20,000 galaxies. And we're looking back in time. We're looking back almost 12 and a half billion years in time. Because as we look a long ways away, it takes light time to get to us. It takes light here 12 and a half billion years to reach us. But when we look back 12 and a half billion years, we're looking to a very different universe. We're looking to a universe that was seven times scrunched compared to now in all three dimensions. And if I scrunch something by seven times, that means that each piece of space is seven times seven times seven times more dense than it is right now, or almost 350 times more dense than right now. And the universe looks different. The galaxies there don't look like they do now. Now, we think if we look even further, we will see a time potentially before there are any galaxies, before galaxies had formed after the Big Bang. And to do that, we want to build a new telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope. This is almost completed. It will be launched in 2018, we hope. And this telescope will be able to look back to what we think will be the first stars. And so we think the picture it takes will look like this. And these little dots here, those are the first stars being formed. We'll see what nature really looks like when we get there. This is what we think it's going to look like, but we will not know until we look. But of course, we will have, for example, these third of the giant new telescopes. This is the telescope that China is involved with, the 30-meter telescope. It will be able to look at the objects, the space telescope pinpoints, and study them in detail and say, what were the first stars like? Did they form giant black holes? How did they form? How many formed? When did they form? Now, I'm impatient. And there's other ways we can learn about this time. 
If you go back earlier, when the universe was 10 million years old, this is what it looked like, nothing. But if we wait a little bit, we can use radio telescopes to get a different view. Whoops. Uh, I should say that if we go back even further with radio telescopes, we see the universe when it was 380,000 years old. At this time, the universe has been scrunched so that it is a billion times denser than it is now. And it's a thousand times hotter than it is now. So the whole universe glowed like the sun. And we see this afterglow of the universe after the Big Bang, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. But I can keep squeezing the universe by just going earlier, but I can't see it. I have to think about it. And if I say, imagine I scrunch the universe even more, it becomes hotter and it becomes denser. And at some point it becomes so hot, nuclear reactions occur. And so one can go back to when the universe was one second old, then the temperature is 10 billion degrees. That's hotter than the center of the sun. It's not quite as dense as the center of the sun, but it's so hot, the nuclear reactions really can't even get started because they destroy themselves. But soon after that, as the universe cools, the nuclear reactions start. So we think the universe is full at this time of protons and neutrons, and then as it cools, those protons and neutrons can get together and make helium. But before they end up getting too far, the universe cools so much that all of the protons and neutrons are converted into helium and hydrogen. And these nuclear reactions are known extremely well here on Earth. So we can actually calculate that the universe should be 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. And when we go out and we look, that's exactly what we see, quite remarkably. Before this, well, things get hotter and hotter, and at some point we go beyond what we're able to create here on Earth. So the Large Hadron Collider at CERN provides the most intense temperatures on Earth. That's sort of about a millisecond, or sorry, a microsecond after the Big Bang. And before that, we have to start guessing. But we can use the fact that the first stars in the universe should be made out of hydrogen and helium and nothing else. So there are a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way and we can go out and use a telescope we've built in Australia called SkyMapper to identify those stars that have no iron in them. Iron has a fingerprint that's relatively easy to identify. And so we've just started our program, but we have already found something very interesting with this very large digital camera. And that is this star. This is the first star that has no iron in it at all. It has less than 30 million times less than our sun. And so the way this works is this is the fingerprint of iron. This was the record in 1995, a star that was 10,000 times poorer in iron than our sun. This was the new record uh, in 2005, uh, a star that had 300,000 times less iron than our sun, and then our new object, no iron at all. But, interestingly enough, it has carbon. This is the fingerprint of carbon. Now, there was no carbon in the Big Bang. What happened? Well, we think this is not a first star. It's a second star. And a second star was produced from a first star that produced no iron. Now, we think most stars should produce iron when they explode as supernovae unless they form giant black holes. 
So one of the surprises earlier this year was the discovery of gravitational waves by two big black holes orbiting themselves. In order to have had a reasonable chance of discovering those two black holes merging, there must be a lot of black holes in the universe. So maybe this is a sign that the first generation of stars produced a lot of black holes. That's a guess. We need to find out what really happens. That is something we're going to learn about in the coming years. So this is one way to do it. Another way is to put a satellite in space and literally look at billions of stars. And this satellite done by ESA, known as Gaia, is doing that right now. It is mapping out a billion stars and asking very precise questions about what each one of those stars is made out of and how it's moving. So the idea is we might be able to figure out how the galaxy came together star by star. All right. Now, I said earlier that the universe went through this dark period, a dark period before stars. And that's true, but the universe would have been glowing, it turns out, in radio. And that's because hydrogen glows in radio when it's cold. And so we might imagine that the universe looks something like that when it was 100 million years old, caused by the first stars. So why does hydrogen glow in radio? <coughs> That's because within an atom, protons and electrons have spin. And when they're aligned, the atom is in a different state than when they're not aligned. And if it changes, then it turns out you get a radio wave, one at 1 1.4 uh, gigahertz, or something not dissimilar to what your phone uses to communicate to the tower. Now, that single photon is very, very faint, but there's a lot of hydrogen in the universe. So if you build ginormous telescopes, you have a chance of seeing these things, but you need to go a place, to a place that is completely free of electronic interference. And for those of you who have ever been out in the middle of Australia, you realize that your cell phone does not work. So here, in the middle of Western Australia, in the desert, we are building a prototype telescope to look for this hydrogen in the early universe. Now, this telescope looks a little different than most telescopes. Normally, to make a telescope focus, whether it be radio or optical, you need to have it be the shape of a giant parabola. But with modern electronics, you can actually use computers to make the parabola in software. And that means, instead of having to build giant telescopes, you can cheat but it's right on the edge of technology. So we are working with this array called the Murchison Wide Field Array in anticipation of the next generation telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. The Square Kilometer Array will be built in Southern Africa and Australia, and it will hopefully eventually have uh, a huge one kilometer by one kilometer scale. Now, you in China also know how to cheat and take shortcuts to making giant telescopes. And this is your telescope, known as the 500 meter, uh, radio, 500 meter across radio telescope, or FAST. This is using the landform in uh, the center of the southern part of China. It's being finished this year. And so by using the landform, you can make the telescope very, very large. So this telescope will be able to see deeper into the universe in hydrogen than anything else when it is built. Uh, it will also be very good for looking at other things like pulsars and potentially uh, whatever happens when these black holes merge that make gravitational waves, we might hope 
to be able to see that with this telescope as well. So this is a very exciting telescope, much bigger than anything else ever built, and an amazing uh, piece of technology, but it will be very challenging to get it working perfectly, I promise you. All right, so my final session is, what is this stuff called dark matter and dark energy? So before I answer that question, I better tell you what dark matter and dark energy are. So I'm going to tell you about, about our discovery, which led to understanding dark energy, and I'll also explain dark matter along the way. So we remember from Hubble, saw that the universe was expanding. But imagine I want to understand what that means. So an expanding universe means that the separation between two galaxies increases over time. So imagine I measure how fast the universe is expanding right now. That allows me to run the universe in reverse and figure out when the Big Bang was. And that is what I was doing when I met Shude back in 1993 or 4. I had just done my best measurement of the how fast is the universe expanding now. This is a much younger me back then. So I had used how fast the universe is expanding to measure how old the universe is. And the number we got was that the universe was about 14 billion years old. It turns out many people were working on that. And the good news is I got the right answer. So that means I get to keep my thesis and my PhD. Now, the problem when we estimated how old the universe would be is that extrapolation, that line is straight. But we know gravity will pull on everything in the universe and slow the expansion of the universe down over time. So if there's a lot of gravity, the universe will take a different path. And for a perfectly reasonable amount of gravity, the age of the universe might be 10 billion years old from my measurements, not 14. And 10 billion was a bad number because we knew that the oldest stars in the universe were at least 12 and a half billion years old just from nuclear physics. And we astronomers are not too fussy, but we do want what is in the universe to be younger, not older than the universe itself. So this sparked the question, why don't we look back in time and see what the universe was doing in the past? By doing that, we could then infer what the universe was gonna do in the future. Because if the universe isn't slowing down much, that means it doesn't have much gravity, it doesn't have much stuff, then the universe just gets bigger and bigger over time. On the other hand, if the universe has a lot of stuff, it will expand, slow down, stop, go in reverse, and form what I like to call the Ganab Gib. That is the Big Bang backwards. So, when I moved to Australia in 1994, I realized we had an opportunity to do this due to new telescopes, new technology, and new ideas. So the idea would be the following. We measure how fast the universe is expanding now, and then we look at progressively more and more distant objects. And if we look back far enough, then I could imagine going through and seeing if the universe was expanding at the same rate in the past as now. So for example, in that case, the universe would just be going along at the same speed. It means it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time and goes on forever. It's infinite into the future. On the other hand, if their universe has a lot of mass in it, then if it's above a critical value of how much mass is in it, then the universe is heavy. And if the universe is slowing down faster than this curve, so down here, the universe ends with a Ganab Gib. 
It ends in the future. On that side of the line, gravity loses, and the universe keeps going forever. All right, so what did we need? Well, we needed the new 10-meter telescopes, Keck. I've already shown you a picture of uh, Uranus earlier by them. But we also needed something really, really bright we could see on the other side of the universe. And nature gives us this in the form of something we call a Type 1a supernova. So imagine two stars are orbiting each other. As the first star puffs up at the end of its life, it can start donating material to the second smaller star, making it heavier. Eventually, that first star runs out of material and shrinks down to a tiny little star called a white dwarf. That little white dwarf and that other star form a very beautiful thing we call a planetary nebula. But things are still happening. When we come back, that second star, which is now the bigger star, starts running out of its material and puffs up as well. And it can start donating material to the white dwarf, making it heavier and heavier and heavier. And when it reaches the magic number of 1.383 times the mass of our sum, it explodes as a giant thermonuclear bomb, producing most of the iron in the universe, the iron which Australia now exports to China. Thank you very much. So these things are amazing. They are five billion times brighter than our sun. They shine for about 20 days before they reach their maximum brightness, and then they fade away into oblivion. But they are so bright that we can track them across the universe. The most distant one we have seen, we have looked back to about 11 billion years in the past with these. But we can measure distances with these, it turns out, very accurately due to my colleagues in Chile who were able to refine how one uses these to measure distances very accurately. So, in 1998, a team that I was part of, and there was also a team at Berkeley who we were competing with, came up with essentially the same but surprising answer. When we measure how fast the universe was expanding back in time, and we compared the nearby objects with the distant objects five or six billion years in the past, you can see they were up above the line. The universe was expanding slower in the past and sped up. Now, when we first measured that, I have to admit, I thought we must have made some sort of error. We checked our work, we checked it again, and then we found out, so essentially, as we were writing the paper up, that the other team was getting the same answer, and they were checking their answer and checking it again. And so we sort of arrived to this conclusion at the same time independently. So the universe is speeding up. It's accelerating. What would do that? Einstein came up with an idea. He came up with an idea in 1917 that if space itself was full of energy, under his equations of general relativity, his theory of gravity, the same one that predicts gravitational waves, that this energy would gravitationally push on itself and cause the universe to accelerate. It turns out that uh, this material he put in there as a mistake. He was going to use this to counteract gravity and keep the universe from expanding at all. Later calls that him acting like a donkey was, I believe, the correct quote. So we don't know what this stuff is. We call it dark energy today. When we made this measurement in 1998, people were rightfully so, skeptical. So they went and looked at other parts of data. And they said, what are some of the other experiments we can do on the universe? One of those groups was in Australia. Uh, and they went out and they mapped galaxies in detail. And I should say that discovery is that work of not just myself, but 20 of us. And here we are in Stockholm all together 
for the only time we've all been together at one point, because we work via the internet. But my colleagues in Australia went through and they said, let's go observe the universe and see what it looks like by how the galaxies form. And we're going to compare what the universe looks like compared to what the universe looks like in a computer. So here's the universe they observe, and here are four different models of the universe. So what I want you to do is use your computer and figure out which model looks like the data. One, two, three, or four. And then I'll tell you the right answer when you do the full analysis, all right? So if you said model one, you're wrong. Model two, you're wrong. Model four, you're wrong. Model three, you're right. Model three is an interesting model. It's a model that's made up of something we call dark matter. Dark matter is material that goes right through itself and everything else and only interacts by gravity. The only thing it can feel is gravity. It would be invisible, but otherwise it seems to imply that the universe is roughly 30% this dark matter, or 25% dark matter, and then there's something mysterious missing. But they're not too sure whether or not it's mysterious or not. It's, it really couldn't tell too much more. Now it turns out those galaxies are formed from what we can see in the very early universe. This is the cosmic microwave background I told you about earlier. And the little bumps and wiggles you see in this image are sound waves. They're sound waves left over from the Big Bang, and they've rippled around at the speed of sound. And it turns out the speed of sound is 57% of the speed of light. We know that very accurately. And we can go through and we can make a prediction of how sound waves travel in the universe. Now it turns out that what the universe is made out of affects how those waves travel. So think of the universe as a pond and I plop a rock in it. If, I, if it's water or honey, it's different. The Big Bang's like throwing a bunch of gravel into the universe. And so you get this ripple pattern which you take a picture of 380,000 years later, and then you get to ask yourself, what does that ripple pattern look like? So it turns out that when you do that experiment, you find out that the universe is made out of dark energy, dark matter, and 5% atoms. So pretty much the same answer that we got in 1998. So what is this dark matter? Well, we really don't know, but we have a guess. Imagine there is a universe full of a particle we have not yet discovered, the dark matter particle. That dark matter particle can travel right through the Earth, just like a neutrino. So neutrinos would be sort of a dark matter particle, except for we know there aren't enough of them. So it's got to be something else. Well, we can sort of go out and measure that in uh, nature. This is known as the bullet cluster. And what we can see here is that we can measure where the dark matter is by how gravity distorts space. So we can see that in these bluish areas. And with x-rays, we can see where the atoms are. And we see as these two groups of galaxies collide with each other, all of the atoms get piled up in the center. It's a big train wreck because atoms interact with each other. But the dark matter just goes whoop, right through itself, just like you would expect. Well, OK, that's a good idea. But what really is dark matter? I want to know, is it a particle? How am I going to find out if it's a particle? Well, we can do this. We have the Large Hadron Collider. Imagine that the dark matter particle can be created by 
crushing atoms into each other, then occasionally you will make a dark matter particle and it will just travel right through the Earth away. Every time they collide atoms together in the Large Hadron Collider, they track each particle. And what they will see is the collision, and then something will suddenly disappear. There will be like something missing. And if you keep on getting the same amount of something missing, you can infer that there's a particle there you didn't know about, the dark matter particle. We have not yet discovered it this way, but that's one way you might. Another way is to go into a mine and put atoms there and hope that dark matter very rarely does interact with atoms. So in this case, we put large amounts of xenon, a very heavy inert gas. We cool it down so it's a liquid. You wait, and when it hits when an atom, sorry, when a dark matter particle collides with a xenon atom, we expect it to put out a little flash of light, which we can detect. So right now, we've kept a hundred and hundreds of kilos of xenon underground for a couple years, and we haven't seen anything. So we're still waiting. The hope is to go to a ton of xenon, or maybe even 10 tons of xenon. Most models for dark matter predict you should see something eventually, if their guesses are correct. And finally, the universe is a great laboratory, and when, for example, we look at the center of our galaxy, we see some unexplained high, some unexplained gamma rays. It had been hoped that potentially those gamma rays were caused when dark matter particles hit each other and maybe annihilated themselves. That is, it might be that uh, dark matter is its own antiparticle. So it would, when it hit itself, maybe produce a gamma ray. Well, I think the betting money now is that what we're seeing is not due to this. But it's still possible, if we keep looking, we will see a similar signature somewhere else in the universe. So there's hope we'll find what dark matter is, but no guarantees. Our worst fear is that dark matter never interacts with atoms in any way, shape, or form. In which case, it will always be a bit of a mystery because we are made of atoms. And if it never interacts with us, the only way we're going to detect it is through gravity. And gravity is a very, very weak force, and we can't measure individual uh, atoms or individual particles with gravity. That would be a terrible, terrible thing if it were true. Dark energy, well, it's hard. The only tool we have right now to measure dark energy is the accelerating expansion itself. And so we can ask the question, does dark energy get created exactly as space is created? That's Einstein's idea. Or is it a little different? If it's a little different, it will change the speed of the universe just slightly differently than what Einstein predicts. So we have been working on this since 1998, collectively as a community. This is how many supernovae we have now. Each one of these objects is a measurement. And this was the answer from 1998. It's still exactly right. There are no deviations from Einstein's prediction. But it's not the only way we can do things. We can go through and use these sound waves and know that uh, we can measure them better and better. And when we do that, this is like an oscilloscope of the universe. It tells you how many sound waves there are. And that measures things very accurately now, too. Again, Einstein, exactly right, still in 2016. Those sound waves eventually become galaxies. And so the sound waves of today end up forming galaxies, and we can look at how big those sound waves are 
in the universe today. And we have done that using giant uh, surveys of galaxies. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And that allows you to see the sound waves in the galaxies of today. What answer do we get? Einstein's dark energy, exactly right. Every way we look at it, we get the same answer, which is that the universe appears to be 70% dark energy that looks an awful lot like what Einstein predicted, 25% this dark matter that seems to just go right through the Earth but has gravity, and 5% atoms. The universe is 95% stuff that we do not understand. Yet, we can predict what it's going to do with exquisite accuracy. So that is the funny place that we find ourselves in astronomy today. So what's our future? Well, in case you didn't know it, the sun is getting hotter. This isn't anything to do with global warming. We're doing that ourselves. And in about 500 million years, it's going to boil off our oceans. And in 5 billion years, it's going to cook us completely and destroy the Earth. But as I told you, there are stars that will last for trillions of years, and we're looking for planets around them. So astronomers are out trying to make sure we have a place to go. But the future of the universe seems to be dark energy, because dark energy is part of space itself. The more it speeds the universe up, the more of it there is compared to us. And so it can push harder on the universe making it expand even faster. So the faster it goes, the faster it wants to go. Eventually, the universe expands so quickly that light traveling from galaxies we can see today will no longer be able to reach us. That is, when a photon tries to go to us, it's going through expanding space, and it stalls. It can no longer get through space. Meaning we're going to live, it seems, in a very lonely place in the future. A place where we are it. Now, it turns out we don't understand dark energy. And until we understand dark energy, anything is possible. Because a good theorist can make dark energy go away or change. But unless the dark energy disappears very quickly, the universe seems to be bound to expand at an ever-increasing rate so that it will slowly fade away and die, leaving us alone and cosmologists like me unemployed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. So, any questions from the audience? Any, any microphones? I think we have them all, should I? Right. Just a second. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the universe is expanding, and uh, the universe is very large. So, my question is, uh, is, it, is, is it expanding at the same speed everywhere in the universe? And is it expanding at the same speed every, direc every direction? Yep. So that's a very good question. So as near as we can tell, the answer is to very high accuracy. The universe is expanding everywhere at the current time the same, at the same speed and in every direction the same. Imagine that the universe was expanding a little different direction, a little bit different in that direction compared to that direction. It turns out when I look at the cosmic microwave background, that means that part of the universe would be at a different distance than that part, which would mean it would look different. But the cosmic microwave background I showed you has all those lumps and bumps, but it's actually the same to one part in 100,000. So those little lumps and bumps are really tiny. So to within a factor of 100,000, one part in 100,000, 
we can show that the universe is expanding in the same way in all directions. It's only if you were to put us in the center of the universe, I don't know what that means, where everything, there's a circle and a sphere around us, which is doing exactly the same thing in all directions, we could be fooled. So imagine I make the universe change in all directions in exactly the same way, and we're right in the center of that. That we couldn't tell. But that would mean we're at the center of the universe, and that sort of goes against our intuition. We should not be a special place in the universe. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Professor, for the very instructive, inspiring presentation. Um, so you mentioned that the, um, um, the dark matter, some people presume that the black hole is made of the dark matter. Uh, is it possible if we capture the dark matter, then we could have a higher control of space-time to create um, uh, the black hole or the wormholes? And the second question is, what do you think is the fundamental drive of the expansion of the universe? Thank you. Okay, so with respect to black holes, black holes, you can't tell what's inside of a black hole. That's sort of by definition. Uh, what's in a black hole stays in a black hole. So, just from a practical point of view, dark matter is very difficult to do anything with because it goes right through everything. So imagine I want to make dark matter change direction. For an atom, I can use a magnet or I can use, uh, you know, electro, I, I can use, you know, I can use electromagnetics. There's many things I can use. I can use mirrors. I can use forces of nature. Dark matter, I can't. The only thing I can use is gravity. So dark matter is not going to be very useful if we could control it, because we can't. That's by definition of doing anything with black holes. So I would say that uh, if anything, if we were going to make our own black holes, we'd probably want to use atoms, because those we can really control by definition. What is driving the expansion of the universe? Well, we don't really know why the universe is expanding. The reason the universe is expanding now <coughs> is because it was born in the Big Bang expanding. And if you want to know why the universe was born expanding in the Big Bang, I'm afraid I could make up an answer, but I don't have an answer for you. It just did. And so what we see is the universe getting bigger and bigger and what is interesting is because the universe is speeding up, the initial Big Bang um, event is no longer driving the expansion of the universe. It is the dark energy and the gravity of how gravity works with that that's driving it now. So that's a complicated answer, but it's a complicated question, although not maybe completely obvious. Okay, maybe... Professor, you mentioned just now that um, the dark energy uh, creates space where it goes. So w why do we distinguish, make a distinguishment between the dark energy and space? Why don't we, why don't we view them as one thing? Well, at some level, if dark energy is truly part of space itself and never ever changes, then you are right. Dark energy is part of the definition of space. But we don't know that yet. What happens if dark energy changes over time? Then it's not part of space. It just inhabits space. So that's one of the big questions. And that's that fundamental question is, what is dark energy? Is it a fundamental property of space? Or is it something like the Higgs field? We all know of the Higgs boson discovery. Well, the reason the Higgs is interesting is it leaves a field behind, energy that's part of space. And it could be that there is some undiscovered particle that would be doing the same thing and creating the dark energy we see. So that would be different than space itself. So that's, that's really the question we're trying to understand. Okay, you go. So in one of your slides, predicting the future, 
you alluded to you alluded to the concept of generating more dark energy or dark matter. So are you saying the percentage of dark matter and dark energy is increasing over time? Yeah, so quite remarkably, in general relativity, as the universe expands, the dark energy in a piece of space stays the same, but the universe, you know, the part of the universe that we can see right now becomes bigger and bigger, right. so the total amount of dark energy increases. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how do you do that? Doesn't that violate <laughs> right. the conservation of energy? Ah, but general relativity has a very complicated accounting system. What is driving the expansion? Well, the expansion itself, that has some term to it as well. And in a simple analogy, dark energy, and this is for the physics literate, uh, people literate in physics, ha has negative pressure. And so if I want to think about the work being done in the universe, I have negative pressure trying to change in volume. So that's negative. The creation of dark energy is positive, and they more or less offset each other. Now, within general relativity, it's not quite that simple, but that's the basic analogy. You have to think about everything, including the expansion, how much stuff there's in the universe, and it turns out the curvature of the universe is another thing we need to worry about. Okay. I uh, just have a question for your data for the acceleration of the universe expansion. Uh, I see there are some at low Z, as a little bit at high Z, there's a sort of a the gap, gap in, the in middle? between. Yeah. So is there any particular object? Or if you have any further far, far away, or your team or someone are working on it? Yeah, so if I show you, well, let's, let's go back to the most recent data. I think mm -hmm. in the initial data, there was really an issue. Uh, and there still is an issue, and it's a te technological issue. Uh, down here, we find the supernovae one by one in galaxies with little telescopes. So I can go and look at a galaxy, look at another galaxy, look at another galaxy, and occasionally a supernova goes off and I find them. Out here, I use a great big telescope, and I only have to look at a tiny little piece of sky that has tens of thousands of galaxies in it. So in that way, I can find supernovae because I get to see thousands of galaxies in one picture. So I'll look at a place for maybe an hour. And so I can take 10 pictures, see 100,000 galaxies, and have a reasonable chance of finding one. In here, I have to look at 1,000 square degrees. So I got to look at a 40th of the sky before I have the chance of finding a supernova. So I can't really do it galaxy by galaxy, because there's just not enough galaxies around, and they're very faint. I've got to look for a half hour or something. And so it's just a technological issue about looking at enough sky in that center bit with a big enough telescope. And the new technology, for example, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where a lot of these were discovered, allows you to get into this area now with huge digital cameras that we haven't had in the past. But in 1998, we didn't have the big digital cameras. So we didn't have any uh, of these uh, exploding stars in the middle bit. Just wasn't able to do it. But we have filled it in now. OK. Maybe at the back, yeah. Yeah, that student over there. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a wonderful talk. And I've got one question related actually to this plot. Uh, we can see that the larger, uh, the supernova with the highest redshift is about one. Yep. But is there any supernova that has much higher redshift? Because if we need to study more about cosmology, we, need, we might need more, uh, further uh, supernovas. But if we don't have these, what are the alternatives as standard candles? Thank you. Yep. So the most distant supernovae we have right now that we can measure distances are literally on this diagram. It is very difficult to go further than this with modern technology because the light of the supernovae gets stretched 
So we need to observe into the infrared, and we do not have giant uh, arrays on giant telescopes yet in the infrared. James Webb Space Telescope will change that. That will allow us to do it. But at some point, we think these objects probably take a billion years or so to form. And so we're probably only going to go back to, a, to the universe when it was maybe a billion and billion and a half years old, even with James Webb Space Telescope. We do have the measurement of the cosmic microwave background. So that is one measurement. Looking at the galaxies and how they trace sound waves, it turns out we can also use that back to uh, probably more distant than we can use the supernovae. But we're always going to struggle with the dark time of the universe. Before there were stars, before there were galaxies. Nothing we're going to measure much easily there, I'm afraid. So we're always going to have to be content that there's that part of the universe we're not going to be able to study very easily. Okay, a question at the back. Um, hello, um, thank you for your talk today. I would like to uh, know more clearly um, why it is if dark matter only interacts uh, with things through gravity, yep. what is it that makes it that we assume dark matter is a type of matter and not an aspect of the force of gravity that we don't understand? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So. Imagine that it's just gravity not behaving quite like I expect. It turns out that uh, you can do that, and you can make it look uh, and make it work just like a particle. Why would I want it to look work just like a particle? Because when I look at the sound waves, and I'll show this oscilloscope. If you go through and say, let's presume it's a particle that doesn't interact with itself, you get exactly the right answer. So when you predict something in advance with an idea, that usually gives it credence. Now, it is true that I can take the laws of gravity and make reproduce this after the fact. But I couldn't tune it before the fact. So what's right? This comes down to a fundamental piece of the, philo the, the philosophy of science. The simplest thing we have right now that predicts what we know and what we observe is how we think of the universe. Right now, the particle idea is a better predictor than the gravity idea, because every time it makes predictions, it gets the right answer, where we have to keep tuning uh, the, the change of, uh, of the modifications to gravity to get them to make the right answer. So it's really a matter of uh, simplicity at this point. OK, more questions? Well, there are two, maybe the... Female student. Oh. <laughs> like me. Um, hi, uh, I don't actually have a very um, nerdy question, but uh, my question is, what prompted your interest in astronomy and why are you passionate about this field? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so, a lot of, I think, when I go out and talk to 10-year-olds, I've yet to meet a 10-year-old who doesn't find the sky and stars and astronomy at least a little interesting. So when I was 10, I became interested in astronomy, but I was really interested in meteorology, the study of weather. I was very sure I was going to become a weatherman. So when I was 16, I went and worked at the weather department up in Anchorage, Alaska. And it wasn't quite what I was expecting. And so suddenly I said, my goodness, what am I going to do when I go to university? I said, well, I like astronomy. It's interesting. It's not very useful, and I'll never get a job doing it. 
but I don't know what to do, so I'll do it anyway because I enjoy it, and I'll figure something else to do with my knowledge later on in life. So that's how I became an astronomer. I never did think I would actually become an astronomer, but I knew by doing astronomy and something I enjoyed, I'd learn math, I'd learn computer programming, I'd learn engineering, I'd learn physics, and I knew those would be useful skills. And I was right. The skills I got in being trained as an astronomer, I could be doing any job on planet Earth almost. Not a ballerina, but anything, you know. <laughs> Uh, not a musician, tried that, didn't work so well. Uh, so that's how I did it. So my, my lesson in life for people is do something that you enjoy, you will do it very, very well, and normally things take, you know, figure themselves out. One thing I can promise you is over the next 50 years, things are going to change so much is that if you think you can predict what is the right thing to study right now to ensure that you have a job 30 years from now, you are a fool. Because I have no idea what things are going to be like 30 years from now. So I would encourage you to do something you're en you enjoy so you do it very well, and doing things well make you uh, skilled at what you do, and that will be useful later on in life, learning how to solve problems and do things that you love. Eventually, sometimes you have to do things you don't like, though, just as a warning. Okay, there's uh, another question just over there. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. So um, during your lecture, you also talked about the expanding universe. So I was wondering, uh, since it's co continually expanding, uh, where do you think the universe is expanding to? Oh. And uh, I also have a second question. Yep. Um, so you also mentioned that dark energy is constantly, uh, is constantly being generated. So I was wondering if at one point in the universe, the, it could be constituted of, say, 99% dark energy and the other parts being very negligible in the composition yep. of the universe. Okay, so what is the universe expanding into? This is a question which uh, I didn't go into in as much detail today as I do sometimes. But in Einstein's theory of general relativity, space, this way, that way, that way, and time are connected. So one of the possibilities is that the universe is infinite. So, infinity just gets bigger. So that's analogous to having a number line where you've got 0, 1, 2, 3. You multiply by 2 and 0 stays where it's at, that's where you're at. 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 8, 8 to 16. Infinity goes to 2 infinity, 2 infinity goes to 4 infinity, and they're on. So, in some sense, that's just part of being infinite. And infinity, I'm not going to make you comfortable with, unless you're already insane. It requires a certain level of insanity to become um, comfortable with infinity. But the universe might be finite. That is, space might bend on to itself, and I didn't talk about that. In which case, the easiest analogy is to think of the universe as a balloon. But it's a balloon in four dimensions, not three dimensions. So the Big Bang is when the balloon is not blown up. And as I make and I blow the balloon up, the balloon becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Where is the Big Bang? Well, it's everywhere, but it's back at the center, at the beginning of time. So as I blow the balloon up, you're moving out in time. The universe is becoming bigger and bigger. Where is the universe going to go in the future? It's going forward in time. So it's expanding into the future. So, there's an analogy that you can uh, stay awake for tonight, Pat. <laughs> okay, maybe last question here. Uh, professor, thank you for your wonderful uh, lecture. I have two questions. One of the best philosophy of uh, China history, Xiong Shi Li, he also constructed a uh, um, university model according to the Chinese classical Zhou Yi. He think, uh, think about because the competition of yin-yang, 
the negative um, force and the positive force. So you, the universe will expand, expand, and then collapse. Yep. They expand, and then collapse. I think uh, his theory is very um, beauty and symmetry. Yep. Uh, according to his theory, now the universe is accelerating, expanding, because I think because the dark energy, the positive um, force is stronger than the, uh, neg uh, the negative force is, is stronger than the positive um, force. So now um, the universe is accelerating, expanding. But this um, uh, situation only one part of the whole universe uh, history. Yep. And can you evaluate his theory? Um, oh. Okay. My so, okay, so let me um, just explain. Okay, so science and the way science works is that you have a series of essentially mathematical laws which you make predictions from a very fundamental basis and you have to predict lots of things. You have to predict the apple that falls off the tree, you have to predict Halley's comet's orbit, you have to predict how atoms interact with each other, and you have to predict that all with one giant physics theory. So in the case of what we're doing, we make predictions, but there is finite information, and so we don't claim to be able to predict with absolute certainty the future, because we could only do that if we have absolute information. So if you look at ideas that you've just talked about, those are ideas based on aesthetics, I would say. And in the same way, I find a universe that you've just described aesthetically very pleasing. I really can't easily predict anything with it. So that is an area of metaphysics. It's different, okay? In the same way, when I talk to people about uh, you know, their view when they ask me, is there a multiverse? Are there other universes out there? Right now, I can't test that idea. I don't know. Aesthetically, I think there might be, but that's a metaphysical statement, not a physical statement. So I think that's the only answer I can say. I realize that I forgot to answer one of the questions here. That's all right. Uh, before I forget, you asked the question, can 99% of the universe be dark energy? And the answer is yes, in the future. Our prediction is in about, oh, 30 billion years. In the future, the universe will be 99% dark energy. And then another 30 billion years after that, it'll be 99.9% .9 dark energy. Another 30 billion years after that, 99.999% dark energy. And it just keeps on going on and on and on. That is, as it fills up more in the universe, it gets bigger, we become less and less important. And in the very, very distant future, it may well be that every elementary particle in the universe has its own infinite universe it lives in. So there's one elementary particle per, per bit of universe, all by itself. So that would be a very lonely universe indeed. Okay, Professor Schmidt has to fly back to Australia right after this lecture. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Brian again. Thank you very much, everyone.